Uh, and how would we go about then configuring the high availability piece and what kind of ah, storage ah, would we have that for that? That is a fine question. That, and that is me. And that yes. is Bennett. That is <coughs> I am Mr. <laughs> high availability. And so I'm racing. I want to get rid of everything. Yeah. You ask for He's going to throw Ang it back at me. below the belt. I, I didn't know. need to. It was on my limp wrist. So. <laughs> so high availability. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And how does this all fit in with storage? So let's talk about what high availability is um, before we dive into the storage. So there are actually two forms of, of high availability when we talk about high, high availability with virtual machines. There's what we call uh, guest operating system clustering and then virtualization platform clustering. And guest operating system clustering is the, the simplest one to talk about. Um, there's only one configuration that works, so I'll go into that. And guest operating system clustering is basically when I take uh, two VMs, if I can write a V instead of a W, I take two VMs and I install an operating system inside those VMs that supports clustering, like Windows Server 2008, Enterprise, or Data Center Edition. I can then go and take uh, iSCSI LAN out on my network somewhere, and I can use the software initiator inside each of these virtual machines to connect to that iSCSI LAN, and I can configure network, uh, con configure clustering just like I would on physical computers. Um, the advantage of this is that you get operating system and application level clustering. So let's say I was running Exchange inside these virtual machines. I could cluster Exchange, and Exchange is going to do all of its data replication and failover and blah, 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 blah. The downsides of doing clustering this way, uh, there, there are a couple. The first one is you need to be running an application that's clustering away. If you're, you know, if you're running Exchange or SQL, that's great. But if you're running an in-house application, it may not be clustering aware. You can't take advantage of this. The second downside is you're limited to being iSCSI only. And the third downside is uh, one of scale. And that is you need to have as many virtual machines as you want to have you know, high availability for. Um, so you know, if I want you know, to have four nodes in the cluster, I need to have four virtual machines. But so this is, this is what we call guest device clustering, and it is you know, quite useful if you need the, the application level clustering. The other clustering, which is the one we talk about a lot more, is what we call virtualization platform clustering. So the concept here is that I can have multiple physical computers. Now, I'm only going to draw two simply because the diagram gets needlessly complicated if I draw more than two. But we support up to uh, 16 physical computers um, you know, participating in a single cluster. And what this model looks like is I then have Hyper-V installed on each of these physical computers. And these physical computers are connected to some form of shared storage. And they then have virtual machines running on top of them. Now what happens here is that these virtual machines are completely unaware of the fact that the platform they're running on is clustered. Um, they're running along happily and there are two interesting operations that get enabled uh, once uh, you know, this platform is clustered. The first one is, is planned failover. And this is where you know, I have, I'm running along and I decide that you know, either I need to do some servicing on this computer or I look at the load inside the computers, and the physical computers, and I decide I need to move a VM off here uh, onto here to free up load. So with this, I can select you know, this virtual machine and say, hey, I want to move him over here. And what this looks like, you know, what happens under the covers here, is that this virtual machine gets put into a safe state. The storage that this virtual machine is residing on gets moved from this computer to this computer, and this virtual machine gets restored over here. Now, for your average virtual machine, what this means is that you're able to move it um, 
between these computer nodes with no data loss, with no risk of data loss, and with under a minute downtime, uh, which is very useful. Now, there is downtime involved, but it's usually quite small. So that's, that's the first scenario, which is, is the planned failover. The second scenario is unplanned failover, which let's say you're running along and you have you know, an issue with this box. Let's say you know, a piece of hardware fails or you know, the power cord oh, gets cool. tripped on. You know, uh, yeah, our favorite one is the rat that gnaws yeah. through the power cord and, and you know, the machine goes down. You know, lesson in life, keep rats out of your data center. Uh, <laughs> so for some reason, this machine goes down, crashes. What will happen here is firstly, the machines crash. You know, the disaster is happening, it's too late. And these virtual machines are now essentially crashed as well. But Windows clustering will detect that this has happened, and it will create these virtual machines over here and start them up. Now, at this stage, those virtual machines will be just like someone who pulled the power cord. So you have to kind of rely on the applications in those virtual machines to be able to survive that. So, you know, Windows will go through and do the check disk. You know, SQL Server, Exchange Server will go and have to do consistency checks. And the reality is, yes, there's always a chance that this happened at the magic moment and data corruption has happened or data loss has happened. But in 99% uh, of cases, these virtual machines start up, do their integrity check, come up, they're up and running. You've had a power failure. At, but you've survived it. So the, the real strength of this is that you can do this without having to have the clustered applications. You know, as, as I mentioned, you know, if you have Exchange, you can do the guest uh, operating system clustering and get all the goodness there. Uh, but if you don't have Exchange, if you're running a custom application in-house, third party that doesn't have clustering support, this can give you a level of high availability uh, without needing to have that. Now, the other interesting thing um, about this, uh, before I go off into the world of storage, is you can actually do clusters on clusters. Um, and this is quite an advanced configuration, but uh, one that we have seen done, where you can say, okay, I'm going to set up my platform clustering like this, and then these two guys are going to be running Exchange, and they're going to be clustered themselves using iSCSI. And this kind of gives you the best of both worlds for availability, but it also gives you the worst of both worlds for complexity. Um, so that, that's kind of the trade-off there. The other really interesting thing about uh, the virtualization platform clustering is the plethora of possible storage configurations. Um, I think there's like seven. <laughs> At least, yeah. um, so with, with guest OS clustering, you use iSCSI. iSCSI is your only option. With um, virtualization platform clustering, we can support any shared storage that Windows Server clustering supports. So this is you know, a SAN. This is Fiber. This is iSCSI. And this is even uh, a file share. So anything that you can do clustering with uh, in, the, in, in the real world uh, works here. The other thing is there's actually a number of interesting different configurations that you can look at for this, each of which have their, their <coughs> own implications and trade-offs. The, the standard configuration that people tend to start with um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to rule not include SMB in here. SMB only has one configuration. You stick the VHDs on a file share and it works. The downside of SMB is you then have to do the work to make sure that that file share is highly available. Um, but it, it's fairly simple. But for, for SAN, Fiber, iSCSI, there are, there are a number of options. Each of, the, each of these technologies have the concept of being able to create LUNs, you know, which are ironically storage virtualization. Um, where you, you know, create these instances that look like separate disks. So the approach that most people start with uh, is they create a LUN and they create